The health of a country's economy is often used to tell what the standard of living or quality of life is like for the people living there. And it is often believed that a stronger economy means happier people. Is that actually true? I researched several questions to try to find an answer. The three standard metrics most commonly used to determine the strength of an economy is unemployment rate, inflation rate, and economic growth, also called macroeconomic indicators, how an economy is doing as a whole. While all three indicators play a role in understanding how an economy is doing, it is economic growth that is the most significant indicator in the health of an economy. In order to tell if an economy is growing or shrinking, economists measure the value of its total output, known as GDP, short for gross domestic product. A formal definition of GDP being the total value of all final goods and services for a particular year or period. The term GDP per capita is the GDP divided by the population, and the term real GDP is used to eliminate the changes in prices over time due to inflation. For example, on average, real GDP in the United States grew at a rate of 3% per year from 1960 to 2007. Due to the fluctuations in economic activity, there are occasions where, when these variations become quite drastic, that governments will decide to intervene in order to slow or reverse the momentum. Primarily, governments use what is known as fiscal policy in order to try and stabilize or influence the economy. This is done through increasing or decreasing government spending and or tax rates. Governments may seek an expansionary fiscal policy during a recession in order to help the economy grow. Or it may implement a contractionary policy in order to decrease inflation to preserve purchasing power. Another tool used to help direct an economy is monetary policy. While this tool is not something used by the government, the institution that is in charge of it is created by the government. A central bank, also known as the Federal Reserve in the United States, is in charge of, among other things, the money supply and interest rates, which, like fiscal policy, can help grow or shrink an economy. Economic growth is viewed as improving standards of living. And greater the standard of living, it is assumed happier the people. One indicator used to gauge standard of living is life expectancy. In the early stages of economic growth, there is a strong correlation between GDP per capita and life expectancy which, on this graph, is up to approximately $5,000. Translated into $2,022, this comes out to around $8,000. People in countries with higher GDP are also happier. Here is the relation between life expectancy and GDP of varying countries. Isolating the African and European countries, shows a clear example of higher GDP correlating with greater happiness. Not only is there a correlation at a set point in time, but also over time, to a point. Here, the longer the arrow, the longer the time frame. What stands out is that as GDP reaches higher levels, the link between happiness and GDP weakens. Not only does it weaken, happiness even begins to decline, which, shown on this graph, is around $25,000. In 2022, this is about $35,000. In the U.S., for example, happiness peaks in the late 1980s, and since then has steadily declined. So what causes this gradual separation between happiness and GDP? 
After a certain point, basic needs have been met. Happiness and life satisfaction rise steeply as one moves from subsistence level poverty to a modest level of economic security, and then levels off. This seemingly contradictory occurrence is called the Easterlin Paradox, which states that those with more income are on average typically happier than those with less income. But over time, as incomes of people improve, their happiness does not go up. Once basic needs are met, even if GDP per capita and personal income grow, two processes begin to appear. Social comparison. We compare what we have to others. And hedonic adaptation, also known as the hedonic treadmill. We get used to what we have. The World Happiness Report is a yearly report published by a United Nations nonprofit that ranks countries based on people's happiness. First published in 2012, it uses data collected from people in over 150 countries through the Gallup World Poll Survey. The happiness score is based on the national average response to the Cantrell Life Ladder question, which states, Imagine a ladder with steps numbered from 0 at the bottom to 10 at the top. The top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you, and the bottom of the ladder represents the worst possible life for you. On which step of the ladder would you say you personally feel you stand at this time? Here are the most recent rankings. I listed the top 20 countries here in order to show the United States ranking of 16th. The colored bars represent different variables used to help give a rough explanation of the variations in happiness across countries. The six variables are real GDP per capita, social support, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, and perceptions of corruption. The purple bar is dystopia, which represents the world's lowest national averages for each variable. Looking at the data, a few things stood out. All of the Nordic countries, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, and Norway, are all in the top 10. And except for Iceland, all have been in the top 10 every year of the study. And all of the top 10 countries are above 40,000 GDP per capita. All of the bottom 10 happiness ranked countries are below 17,000 GDP per capita. A few other countries stood out. Costa Rica, with a high happiness ranking overall, has a mid-GDP rating. Botswana, with a low happiness ranking, has a mid-GDP rating. And Venezuela, being outside the lowest ranking group in regards to happiness, is last in GDP. Meaning, even though Venezuela has the lowest GDP among all of the 145 countries in the study, there are 37 other countries listed as less happy. There are a couple things the highest rated countries have in common economically. All of the top 10 countries are above 40,000 GDP per capita. And most of them have a strong social welfare system and therefore are highly taxed. Using GDP as a gauge of economic strength, studies show a positive correlation between GDP and happiness, to a point. Sufficient economic growth provides goods and services that make it possible to have easier access to basic necessities. Having these basic needs met is essential to happiness. And while continuing economic growth means quantity and quality increases, it does not necessarily mean happier people. 
there's a diminishing marginal utility of income. High GDP does not guarantee high happiness. But low GDP does guarantee low happiness. The happiest countries in the world tend to be high income countries that also have a high degree of social equality, trust, and quality governance. Most national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonders in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Specs knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. 